So hey everybody, <laughs> here we are again on a Sunday evening. We've been in such a season of training and development. And with that, so much growth. I see a people with roots that go so deep into the ground, growing to produce these strong, firm trees that are now beginning to produce fruit. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Moni, and I'm the deep, intense one. At least that's what they tell me. <laughs> so, I come with a word and instruction as always, but really with the heart of God. Um, I feel the heart of God so intensely on this message. Um, and when, I came, when it came to this message and putting it together, because he'll give me um, a topic or a title, and, but I won't know what it has to do with. He'll just say, you're going to preach on the depths of my presence. And I'll be like, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to hear what else you got. Because I can go up there and be like, the depths of his presence. That's all I've got, you know. <laughs> um, and so I wrestled uh, about how to put it together. I wrestled with myself about how to get my point across. But then God set me free and he said, why don't you let me get my point across? And I was like, yes, good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> See, I was trying to figure out how to put this message together like all of my past messages. For some reason, it was just not right. I had all these thoughts. I was trying to figure out the theology of it to give you guys these words in the Greek and words in the Hebrew and big Latin and whatever, you know. <laughs> you know? Because all my past messages, that's what he's done, um, and that's the way he's formatted it. Um, and he, for some reason, just wasn't right. Um, and he said, nope, this is going to be different. Why don't you just let me put it together for you? And so in saying that, this message is not going to look like my past messages that I've taught. Um, this message is going to appeal to the prophetic or the spiritual side of things more. Which God must believe that we're ready for more of the spiritual things. My hope is that this message will reignite and add some wood to that fire that is always already within us for more of God. That it would strike up a hunger to know more of who Jesus is and to seek him out for yourselves. I'm going to pray. Lord, we come before you right now and we just pray that your word would go out, Lord God, in truth, Lord. I pray, Lord God, against any hindering spirits, Lord, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, which I believe you already broke those things off, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would break things off of our minds, Lord God, that would not allow us to receive, Lord God, in this place. I pray, Lord God, that everything that is spoken, Lord, there would be an impartation that goes out for us to seek you deeper, Lord God, to find more of you, Lord God. I pray that I would step out of the way and that you would take over, Lord God. And we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today we're going to start with a definition. Imagination, which is very fitting because of the song that was played. And I did ask Jenny to play that song, so <laughs> I can only imagine, right? Imagination is the ability of the mind to be creative or resourceful. The part of the mind that imagines things. The act or power of forming a mental image of something not present to the senses or never before wholly perceived in our reality. Okay? As children, we are born with a creative nature. Because our father, our creator, he is creative, Amen. right? Yes. It says that he made man in his own image and likeness. So when children are born, they're innocent. Their minds are open. Did you ever hear they're like sponges, right? They're, these minds are then molded by people placed in their lives that teach them things or situations situations that happen in their lives that teach them things their parent parents guardians teachers friends and all of those around them who are allowed to influence them 
Children's minds are also influenced by what they watch, see, and hear. When we're young, our imaginations are working and can soar without limits. We are creative. Until something that is based on a man-made limitation or even an earthly limitation is placed upon us. I'm going to give you an example. A child is innocent to the perils of the pain of falling. They don't understand the earthly principle of gravity. What goes up must come down. We have to fall a couple times to feel the pain of falling in order for boundaries to now be placed upon our minds. I know we've all seen it. Kids jumping from high heights with no sense of the fear of pain. That child that jumps from the dresser to the bed or jumps off the porch or even attempting to jump from a roof of something onto a trampoline or into a swimming pool. <laughs> then the adult who knows what the outcome will be <laughs> warms them. And most of the time it ends up with a broken bone or two. Then the mind makes the conclusion that this body is fragile and I cannot do everything that my imagination tells me I can do. What about man-made limits? Let's take, for example, children when they decide what they want to be when they grow up. An astronaut, a basketball player, a firefighter, a soccer player, a doctor. All of these things that we as adults see the odds against our children. We see all the limitations of how they will get there. And please, I'm in the same boat. Parents, no judgment from me. I, too, was an imagination killer. I didn't want to break my son's heart by telling him that he was not going to be in the NBA. But when you think about it, why? Why did I believe he was not going to be in the NBA? Who says that he won't ever be a great basketball player? Well, it's the man-made limitations. You see, I, as an adult, seen the limits when it came to his passion for the sport. I see the limits in our funds as a family. I seen the lack of time spent in practice <laughs> and the lack of desire on my part to do what it would take to get him to the NBA. <laughs> we see the success stories and how the greats came to be. Many of them that came from unlikely circumstances, but did what we would call the impossible. They defied all the odds, so to say. So, instead of letting our imaginations fly, we have boundaries placed upon our minds that then go on to define who or what we will become as adults. Here's another example. Those who raised me said that I would never amount to anything, so I remain in a cycle of dead-end jobs, living check to check because of boundaries that were placed upon me. It's up to me to break that cycle. This can also be said with placing limitations on children to keep them safe. We say, don't go over there. You'll fall and get hurt. When my husband was growing up in Mexico, um, there was a Pentecostal church close to his house. Um, and in Mexico, they call them the Alleluias. And he was, him and his uh, brothers and sisters were warned not to go down a certain street because el diablo estaba ahí. The devil was over there. She did not want her kids walking into that Pentecostal church. So, she had placed these limitations upon their minds to tell them the devil's over there, don't go over there. So it was up to him to break that cycle to become an hallelujah, knowing how his mother felt about them, knowing what that would mean for his future. When I was little, 
I grew up in a Hispanic home. My grandparents and Thea, join his mom, used to babysit a whole lot while my parents were working. And it was all about not going in the basement. So my tia didn't want us playing in the basement. So we were told that the kukui would get us if we were in the basement. For those of you who don't know, the kukui is a monster. And I'm sure every Hispanic kid can give you a different definition of who the kukui was and what he looked like. When all the while, it was just the parents' way of getting the children to not get hurt. I'm sure they didn't want us messing with the water heater, the electrical box, the washing machine, etc. But instead of explaining that and believing that we as kids could be taught, they told us something that put boundaries upon our minds that had a foundation in fear. The cycle would go on and on until I and my cousins choose to break that cycle. This goes with most man-made limits. Okay, so I promise I'm going somewhere with this. We're gonna come back to our imaginations in a bit. Let's take a look at the verses that we have for tonight. We are gonna go to Ezekiel 47. I believe I have it in the NIV. And I'm going to premise this by saying this, um, these verses of scripture was a vision that was shown to Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet in that time who helped to guide Israel during Israel's exile and captivity. Okay? I'm going to read 1 through 11. And I may stop, you know, here and there just to explain stuff. So it says, the man... Right there. Uh, it's in the vision. It's the angel that was sent as a guide to show Ezekiel this vision. So that's who the man is. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple. And I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple. South of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east, and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. Now, a measuring line was a tool that they used to measure in that time. And cubits is a measurement of distance that was used, okay? And then led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the river had risen and was so deep, deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Gliam. There will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. So, in this passage, what the Lord is showing to Ezekiel was the river of God's presence that flows from the throne of God. It is a life-giving river. 
He showed it to him in distance measuring off. The farther the distance, the deeper the water became until the water was too deep to swim in. These waters were flowing out of the altar that was placed in the temple. Let's bring this into today. We know that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And we must have an altar. And as we spend time on that altar, as we spend time at our altars, the waters of the Spirit begin to flow to fill the temple. And the deeper into his presence we go, the farther into the water we reach. As this is happening, the less control we have. You ever experience that when you're walking into the ocean? The deeper you go and the waves are coming and they're just like pushing you, you know? And finally you get to a place where your feet can't stand anymore and you're just, wherever the waves are going, that's where you're going. Right? Imagine it. You're wading into deeper waters. The deeper you get, the more the waves move. Until you can't reach the floor. Now you have to swim. So let's break it down. The first thing that must happen is that we must have an altar. What does that mean? That is a place where we play. Pray. We don't play. I mean, maybe some of us do. <laughs> we, we pray. Wherever we are, we can build an altar. And an altar is a place that is erected in our lives for sacrifice. Where we come to sacrifice ourselves to God. Yeah. Then the waters begin to flow. The spirit begins to flow. And the farther we go into his presence, the deeper we go. The more of the water that there is. Okay, so now that we know this, the thing that keeps us as humans from going deeper into the presence of God are those man-made limitations that have been placed upon our minds. The negative connotations that come with being in water without some sort of flotation device. Or diving deep without oxygen. Going in not knowing how to swim. The fact that if you go too deep, you might not come back up. So in order to go deep, we have to allow God to break off those man-made limitations from our minds so that we can go deep into the spirit. Now, these are things that have placed upon us in the physical, but I'm telling you that they do affect the spiritual. I'm going to give you an example that will make this relatable. So, God speaks to me a lot through movies. So, the movie that we're going to look at today is Disney's Moana. Now, I am not supporting the views of the company. I am just using this as an example. So please don't get all religious on me. <laughs> For those of you that do not know, the story of Moana, this is a summary. Moana is Hawaiian, and she was born on the island. She is also in line to be the next chief of her people. Her generation was raised with the mentality that all they ever need comes from that island. All that they ever will want can be found on that island. They never need to leave it. They must remain within the confines and boundaries of the island. The elders make it known that to confirm this, this is why our island is surrounded by water. So in order to leave, they will have to face the perils of the sea. But you see, the problem arises when they begin to have a lack of good fruit and food on the island. And Moana notices this. And the elders notice this. Throughout the story, Moana has this voice inside that's calling her to go out and explore what is beyond the boundaries. What is in the sea? In fact, there's a song that she sings called How Far I'll Go. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to read the lyrics, though. It says like this. I've been staring at the edge of the water, 
long as I can remember, never really knowing why. I wish I could be the perfect daughter, but I come back to the water no matter how hard I try. Every turn I take, every trail I track, every path I make, every road leads back to the place I know where I cannot go, where I long to be. So there's something inside of her calling her to go where no one else has gone before. But there are negative connotations that come with that. Man-made rules and limits placed upon her. But that voice or that spirit inside is speaking something different. It goes on to say, see the line where the sky meets the sea, and that's the horizon. She's looking out to the horizon. It calls me, and no one knows how far it goes. If the wind in my sail on the sea stays behind me, one day I'll know. If I go, there's just no telling how far I'll go. I know everybody on this island. Check this part out. She says, I know everybody on this island seems so happy on this island. Everything is by design. I know everybody on this island has a role on this island. So maybe I can roll with mine. She's saying, everybody has a role or a place. Why can't I just find my place in line? Why can't I just fall in like everybody else? She says, I can lead with pride. I can make us strong. I'll be satisfied if I play along. But the voice inside sings a different song. What is wrong with me? She's saying, why can't I just be satisfied with the known? With everyday life, like everybody else. Why do I see something else? Why do I long for more? Why do I long for purpose? There must be something wrong with me because I don't see the world like everyone else. I'm not satisfied with this being all there is. There has to be more. Yes. Come on. The song goes on to say, see the light as it shines in the sea, it's blinding. But no one knows how deep it goes. And it seems like it's calling out to me, so come find me and let me know what's beyond that line. Will I cross that line? See the line where the sky meets the sea, it calls me. And no one knows how far it goes. If the wind in my sail on the sea stays behind me, one day I'll know how far I'll go. And Corey's going to show a video clip of it. <laughs> and um, where he's starting is the very end of the song where she's actually walking up to like a hill where her ancestors, each chief that has gone before, has walked up this hill and they've placed their stone upon um, the chief before stone. And it's just saying, okay, I am going to lead um, from the island. I'm going to lead on the island. I'm going to lead the people. And so you see this point where she's going up to do that and she actually ends up throwing it down because she looks to the horizon and she throws it down and says, no, I'm going to go out there and see what's out there. So what ends up happening in this story is Moana's grandmother passes away and ends up guiding her to go beyond the limits and the boundaries of the island. And she does this to save the island. But she ends up finding out that her ancestors were voyagers and that they used to sail the sea and explore the depths. But because of one generation's fear, a man-made limitation was placed upon the minds of her people, keeping them on this little island and not going beyond to find out all that the world had to offer. Let's bring that into the spiritual. Amen. Did you know? That God is so vast that he is limitless. Yes. His presence is endless. He has no beginning and no end. He speaks and we can hear him. The limits that we have placed upon God are man-made from fears of man. Amen. But how far will you go? You can have as much of God as you want. Right. Yes. It's up to us to go deeper. Yeah. It's up to us to take off the limitations. Yes. I'm talking about spending time in his presence. Amen. Yes. Coming to him without an agenda. I'm going to read an entry from one of my journals. And I am going to share a couple of experiences that I have had. And God 
did want me to share these. Um, so you can see that this stuff is possible. It was something God spoke to me after showing me a vision that I'm going to share as well. So this was January 14th, 2024. It was the weekend of the big storm that took out lots of people's power for the whole weekend. Remember that? Church got canceled. Everything got canceled. I was spending time in his presence, and the Lord gave me this vision. It began with myself and Jesus in a pool of water, and we were playing. We were playing like father and daughter. He picked me up and threw me into the deep end of the pool. And I swam back, and he picked me up again, and he threw me a little deeper. And I would laugh and come back for more. I loved it. Just like a little girl playing with her daddy, jumping off his shoulders. Have you ever done that? In a pool, you jump off someone's shoulders, and you, they throw you into the deep end, and you come back, and you're like, again, again. Then, all of a sudden, the pool transformed into a large body of water, an ocean. It was a body of water with no floor, depths unseen and unknown. Then I looked, and I saw Jesus so small in the ocean next to me. But then when I blinked, Jesus went from being in the water beside me to being huge, and the ocean and myself were inside of Jesus. I remember hearing these questions in my mind. Will you be afraid when you know your daddy is with you? Will you let him throw you into the deep end? Then when I came up out of the vision, the Lord told me, grab three pencils, because I'm going to speak to you of three things. I'm going to share with you the first thing. He said this. Number one is, how far will you go? How far is one willing to go? How, now, these are the words of Jesus that I've written down. How far is one willing to go? How far is one willing to release their minds to Christ? There are so many depths in me. I am infinite. In infinite knowledge, revelation. But how far is one willing to go? How much are you willing to let go of this reality to step into my reality? The reality of the knowledge of the kingdom, my kingdom. My ways and knowledge are higher than that of this world. In order to tap into that, one must be willing not only to lift the ceiling, but allow for the floor to drop. Allowing me to be the foundation. So only you determine how far you will go. He said, will you step into depths of a pool only reaching feet dip, deep? Will you go as far as a lake with depths a little deeper? Or will you flow into the river of my revelation knowledge and let it release you into the ocean of my knowledge? With depths that man could never measure. Then he said, will you explore the riches of my depths? Then he gave me the answer. I say yes. I was so overwhelmed by this word. And I understood what he was saying to me. I knew I had to take off the limitations that had been placed upon me by human thinking. The fact that they say women can't preach. The fact that I never went to Bible college. Never mind that, I never went to college. Not without much trying on my dad's part. <laughs> I don't have the right pedigree, according to them. I don't look the part, they say. But wait, who are they? Right, right. Come on. It only matters what you say. And if you tell me to preach, I will preach. If you tell me to speak, I will speak. If you tell me to go, I will go. Because the only voice that matters is yours, God. And if you say I can have as much of you as I want, then I say, give me more. But that will require more time, more sacrifice. 
And I wondered how to share with you all how to do this because I've only just begun. And he said, tell them to dwell with me and in me. He spoke to me the other day after watching my daughter, um, Abigail, trying to create some sort of pulley system using my brand new couch and a bookshelf. She had old um, chargers and a jump rope and a basket and tape. Um, and Abigail is a creative. She loves trying to build stuff. She loves baking. Well, as I'm watching her do this, obviously I'm thinking, she's going to rip the couch. She's going to make the bookshelf, you know, tip over. But I said nothing. I let her do it. I let her show me how it works. I was like, that's so cool. She actually did get it to work. And like you pulled it and the little pulley would go up. And then she was like, yeah, then someone can put something in it. And if I'm sitting on the couch and I want something, I'll go like this. And it comes down. And like she had like candy or whatever was in it. <laughs> and so um, she was doing that. And I went to pray after, you know, all this was happening. And he says to me, you see, just as your child wants to spend time with you and wants your approval, she wants to be creative, but wants you to approve of what she does. See, I could only see the mess she was creating, thinking, why doesn't she ask me first? Then God said, this is how I see you, how I see my children. If only they would come to me first and sit in my presence and seek me first, and I can instruct them, but they must know me first, the different parts of me. How to sit in my presence without agenda, without their plan. Just come to dwell. And every time I take them deeper past their own man-made thoughts of who I am Amen. or what I can do. I want, to see them, I want them to see me in my fullness, yeah. but it requires death to self, death to man-made plans. Mm -hmm. To come into my presence and to see me with the eyes and the heart of a child. The one who knows no reje rejection, so has no limits. They have no holds bar on me or my presence. Amen. To take them deep into my thoughts, into my heart where I live, where I dwell, where I wait to take them on adventures and teach them of me. Teach them of my kingdom. Amen. So he said to begin with dwell. It is where the river of his presence begins. To dwell is to get into a place where we freely relinquish control, where fear is gone, where he can reveal more of himself to us. You see, when we dwell with him, the more that we dwell, the waters will be released until we're swimming deep in his presence. In this world, but not of it. Seated with him in heavenly places. This is the place where he can tell us his secrets. Where he can show us how he sees us. The more we remain, the more we abide, the deeper we can go. There are no measurements to his presence. The only measure is man-made. And it's put on time spent with him. Man stops after their time clock is up or after their list is finished. We must learn to dwell a little longer. Yes. Psalm 91 states that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. These are both Psalms. With Psalm 91 said to be written by Moses, and Psalm 27 written by King David. Both men who knew God who spent time in the presence of God, who did not allow man's perception 
of who God is to define the God they served and how they served him. Men who went far and deep and wide, who searched the riches of God's depths, paving the way for us. They found that the key was in dwelling, spending time in the presence of God. We make it hard. We say, I don't have time. But how much time do you do everything, take to do everything else? I'm not saying three hours. If you spent five minutes with him, try spending six. And that next minute, no agenda. No list. Just wait to see what he says to you. So let's go back to the scripture in Ezekiel 47. It says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. So the last bit of this vision that he was shown um, where he's seen the temple, he's seen the waters flowing from the altar. Then they went into a river that flowed and it went out into a very big ocean. Okay, well, he showed him the banks or the sides of this river. And on the sides of this river are these trees. And you want to know what it brings to mind. I don't know if you guys remember. God gave a vision, um, I think it was to mom. And it was of the altar. And there was a portal open here. And we were all standing along the sides telling people to come in. And when I, just now, when I thought of that, we represent the trees that are firmly rooted in that river of the presence of God. And we're welcoming people, not to us, but to his presence. But as they come along and come down this river, they're going to stop at a tree because they're feeling they need a little healing. So let me grab a leaf from this tree to help heal my wound. Okay, I can keep going. Oh, this, I'm so hungry. Oh, this tree has good fruit. I'm gonna eat that. That gives me what I need to keep going. And so as we are firmly rooted and we are living in the presence of God, that river flows out of us, drawing people to him. Making him the main attraction. Yes, that's it. I had a, a vision about this. Um, and you all can stand. In this vision, um, this was last week sometime. And I don't remember what day or whatever, but I was praying about this message. And I have learned to dwell in his presence. I have learned to go about my day talking to him without ceasing. So I wake up in the morning and I say, good morning, Jesus. I love you. I submit myself to you today before I get out of the bed. Then I go and I make my coffee and I'm like, thank you, Jesus, so much for this coffee. I love coffee so much. <laughs> and I say, protect my children, Lord. Walk with them and guide them. And as my day goes, he is getting my list. He's getting my list of all the things that are on my mind that I'm just walking and talking with him about. Then there are times where he says, I just want to spend time with you. So then when I say, okay, God, and I turn on my music, I enter into his presence like that. Because I had been praying without ceasing throughout the day. When I came to his presence, I didn't have a list anymore because I already told it to him. So I was, I was okay to just sit there and listen. I was okay to just sit and dwell in his presence. So last week, Tuesday or something, I had this vision. And in the vision... It was, um, 
I was sitting down in my living room and he came and sat next to me and he looked at me and he was like right here and it's just his silhouette I don't really know what God looks like so don't ask me <laughs> I just know he was Jesus and we went like this put our hands together and he smiled at me and he said and I could feel him saying come on let's go check something out and I was like okay so I got up and he grabbed me and he and I began to run and he began to spin me and I was spinning like you would play with you know your daughter and where we were turned into this beautiful garden and I, we went to a waterfall like the one we've seen in Moana and we stood there and I looked up at it and he put his arm around me and he looked at me and he pointed and I looked and I was like yeah it's awesome he's like come on so then we kept walking and I seen the water go down onto like a babbling brook and I seen how the waters were like crystal clear and I went and I put my hand in and I drank some and I was like it was warm and it was crisp and it just it tasted sweet like honey and I looked up at him and he said come on so then we walked a little further along I was walking on the inside of the banks on the shore and I saw these trees and I saw a little tree and it looked like it was withered and it looked like it was dying and I don't remember if it was God or me I think it was me I grabbed water and I cupped it in my hand and I went to the little tree and I put water on the tree and I kept putting water on the tree and God began to explain to me that the trees that I seen that were huge that had good fruit spent time daily in his presence the other trees have gone a long time without sitting in his presence but they were not beyond repair because when they come into the presence now it's time for pruning now it's time to take off the dead pieces so that they can continue to grow see the trees on the banks of the river give fruit in every season not only that there were leaves and fruit to help the rest of the body the fruit to feed and leaves for healing so when we spend time in his presence when we dwell we begin to take off those man-made limitations we can then let our imagination soar and it comes from praying without ceasing when we wake up in the morning and we say good morning jesus and we begin to give him our list throughout the day then there are those moments when we don't look at the time clock we enter right into the depths of his presence we are there to spend time with him he will begin to show us things and speak to us of his plans his burdens his will we must let our imagination soar who says you can't dance with jesus i've done it who says you can't play with him in water as he throws you in the deep end i have done it who says that when you're laying on your face deep in sorrow and sadness he won't come and hold you and caress your hair i have experienced it i'm here tonight to tell you that jesus waits to spend time with you he waits to spend time with us to show us more than we can imagine i believe that the question for us today is how far will i go i want more of you god we want more will we search out the depths of his presence as jesus said i say yes, yes. the altar is here don't lose the opportunity today to begin to dwell and if you have not yet made him your savior today is the day of salvation he died for you and for me yes. all you have to do is ask him to forgive and he will forgive and he will fill you with his spirit who told you that his spirit's not for you i have experienced it and i know you can experience it too jesus this 
for all. His spirit is for all. So this altar is open. Will you come? My children, when will you get tired of waiting? Waiting in the shallow. When will you not want to be in the shallow anymore? Do you not know I have called you into the deep? That I hold my hands out for you to come to me. That I sit and wait. I do not have time. There's not time in me. So whenever you choose to come to the deep, there I am. With my arms open wide, waiting for you. Come to me. I will not let you drown. 